Hello everyone and welcome to another special episode of Market Talk and this is in association with Hobart again. Uh, now as part of Hobart's big conversation, Catering Insight has been reaching out to the UK dealer community and one of the themes that we discussed was after sales and service, so we're going to be concentrating on that today. So with us today, we have Ian Munro, who is the Business Development Director of Hobart UK's Equipment Division. And we have Paul Gilhooley, who is the Sales Director of Brat Brothers Catering Equipment. Dean Warbent, who is the Managing Director of Miller's Catering Equipment. And Nick Place, who is the Sales Manager of Advantage Catering Equipment. So welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. So I'm going to kick straight on with the questions. So the first one on, on the uh, roster today is, what are the ideal attributes of a catering equipment supplier's after sales offering? So as the supplier representative on this panel, Ian, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, well, obviously, Emily, I think um, after sales, it's very much about um, staff training. I think we have a lot of issues around uh, operations, making sure that the product and the, the staff know how the equipment works. So, I mean, Hobart uh, offer actually life cycle or lifetime training. So, you know, not many manufacturers uh, do, do give that support. Obviously, it's not a weekly offer, but it is something that we, we understand that um, customers, staff change, particularly at the moment, there might be high levels of staff turnover. So, we do it, we're there to support, support the dealer and support the customer with, um, with training and making sure that the, the equipment's been used. Obviously, we would emphasise that uh, maintenance is a key part of of the after sales part, and the customer must recognise that you know if they're not maintaining their equipment, then it's like any piece of equipment. If it falls over, it's uh, it's the piece of the uh, of the engine room that they need to work daily, and that they gain their revenue from. And if they don't treat it in the same way, then it's always going to have an impact. And you know, obviously, from us, uh, we can also add some culinary support. Um, and, and be there uh, after and support the dealer. So I think I think uh, it's making sure the customer really understands the equipment, it works, and the the equipment that he's purchased um, fits his needs, and um, and that we're there to support them and the dealer. Right. Yeah. So from the other side of things, from a dealer's perspective, um, what would you guys uh, like to see from a supplier in terms of their after sales? Dean, I'll start with you. I think for us, Claire, the most important thing is probably speed of response because and that needn't necessarily be speed of fix because often, you know, we can undertake some of that work ourselves. But it's really, we, we're kind of the, 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 the middle of the chain, aren't we? Because we've got the customer who's the end user. We've got the manufacturer who's built the thing. And for us, getting stuck in the middle a little bit, it's all about speed of response and availability. Because if we don't get that from the manufacturer, then frankly, it kind of reflects badly on us. We're the ones that are typically then managing the customer and then the manufacturer. So there's quite a lot of inefficiency that gets driven into our business as a result of a lack of speed of responsiveness or availability. I think typically the accuracy that we get back is pretty strong. You know, I think to, to Ian's point, the, the manufacturers are, are well trained. I think they're, they're Credible in how they answer. I think our, our biggest consideration is just making sure that we can have access to those guys quickly so that we can feed back quickly to our customer. Um, you know, that for me, I think is probably the key attribute and the, the, the key feature of perhaps what we don't have right now, particularly under the circumstances. You know, everybody's struggling with staff. I understand that. Work from home, I understand that. Um, but nonetheless, that doesn't solve the problem. The customer is still waiting for someone to get back to him, perhaps, with um, an answer to a query. Right, yeah. um, Paul, would you agree with those sentiments? Uh, do do Grat Brothers uh, want to rely on their suppliers for after sales? Um, we work in tandem with them. Um, I agree with what Dean and uh, Ian said there. A couple of other things I'd, I'd like to add, if I may. Um, Things will go wrong, uh, so it is after the sale. So spares availability is uh, is a key thing. Um, um, we know that spares aren't going to be available um, uh, forever in a day. There will be a cut off time when spares 
uh, become obsolete, but um, there should be a reasonable time. There's an expectation of the client that if something goes wrong, it could be fixed within if they've had it six, eight, ten years and they have maintained it and looked after it, etc. The other uh, critical element for us is um, the information that's available in terms of tech support or technical information support. Um, uh, that's key, um, that it's available digitally, but also in a human way. Um, we welcome opportunities from suppliers like Hobart to train our engineers um, so that um, um, uh, when it runs out of its warranty period and goes into preventative maintenance plan, for instance, that um, our engineers are competent um, and, uh, and confident in diagnosing and fixing that equipment. Rightio. And uh, Nick, for advantage, what, what do you think the uh, ideal attributes of a supplier's after-sales service should be? I think all the guys hit a lot of the points I was going to mention, particularly Paul. Uh, for me, it's about product knowledge, training. Most of the times we get equipment failure, dare I say, it's it down to user error. Uh, we get a lot of that. So if we could get more training or on a technical basis from the manufacturer, we could often stop the repair in its tracks. It would never get to the manufacturers because we'd often be able to say to customers, no, look, guys, you need to do it this way or that way. So, yeah, I'd echo everyone's thoughts, but just to emphasize on that. Um, so on to the next question then. So um, how proactive should a supplier be about garnering uh, operator customer feedback following a sale? Sh should they go directly uh, to the end user uh, as the uh, supplier representative on the panel here? Ian, what do you think? I think it's, it depends on who owns the customer, really. Obviously, you know, um, as manufacturers have set up and Hobart probably uh, the last to the game of the, the dealer route to market, um, you know, it, it's the it's essentially the, the dealer's customer. I think it, we would be guided by the dealer as to what level of support they need. And um, we would be hoping, obviously, that they're making their own follow-ups themselves. And if there are issues that are identified, then we can address them and support them, whether it be technical or training. And I think that's that's kind of, we would we would kind of leave it with the dealer to steer us. But we, we're more than, you know, we have a, an extensive regional sales team so we're there to support, which is why we can we can provide sort of the training uh, levels that we do. So we, as I say, we'd be guided by the dealer. Right, Theo. Um, Nick, I'll come to you first. So, would you appreciate uh, suppliers uh, going to the end users for feedback on on, on after sales and service? I, I've got to agree with you. It's got to be led by the by the dealer. Um, I always encourage manufacturers to get involved but only at a level that I think is right for my particular customer. Sometimes it can confuse the issue. Customer buys from me um, so I would say not. Right, uh, Dean, how, how about you? Would you agree with those sentiments? Yeah, I think um, generally the um, ownership of the customer is a little bit grey sometimes and I think it's important that the supplier and the dealer are real clear on this because principally the dealer is the um, person that sold the equipment therefore the relationship fundamentally exists between the dealer and the, the customer um, i know why the manufacturers wish to engage with the end user and it makes perfect sense but frankly it just it interferes with what we're trying to do and i think <clears throat> often provides a conflict i know it's been achieved it's, it's attempting to achieve something that you know is beneficial and advantageous to all. But I actually think often it can create a little bit of confusion, a little bit of conflict, because um, you know the dealer may be saying something slightly different to the manufacturer for whatever reason. And then typically the manufacturer's view is always the one that is believed because of who they are. And you know, I just feel that in the, in the industry generally, there is a, a lack of clarity around who owns the customer. Um, and hence, I think it should always be the dealer that is looking for that feedback principally and then only feeding it up the chain to the manufacturer um, as and when. That can be good and bad feedback, by the way. I don't think it's all negative necessarily. There's a lot of uh, instances where it's positive, but I do think it's a dealer's responsibility. Right, Theo. And, <laughs> and how about you, Paul? Would you say uh, suppliers stay away from the end user? <laughs> um, well, we work 
in partnership with suppliers and manufacturers. We wouldn't sell anything that we wouldn't be prepared to stand next to and, and recommend. So, um, um, but um, I'd say I agree with uh, with both Dean and Nick um, in, in that the uh, the first port of call should be the, the, the dealer or distributor. Um, I do think that the manufacturers and suppliers would have a duty of care to make sure that their brand's being protected. So they really should only be proactive or getting involved if they think their reputation or brand is being called into dis dis disrepute. Somebody can continually installing a piece of equipment incorrectly, et cetera, or something that might put somebody's health and safety at risk. You know, that's really the only time that they, I believe they should get proactively involved. We'd welcome uh, a, a proactive relationship with the manufacturer and supplier and talk to us. Um, we do do after sales checks. We do, um, we do randomly um, from head office get uh, audited on uh, on customer feedback and I think it's never been easier frankly in this digital age you can do a survey monkey etc it's very easy to do um, um, uh, and it's very important to do it also so I, I agree with Dean and Nick in that I think I think it's the primary responsibility of the distributor and the dealer um, they should work in tandem with the supplier and really the supplier manufacturer should only really be um, contacting that contacting that customer in conjunction with their with their with their partner dealer i, would, I, I think i would add though i mean obviously there are uh, certain particularly whether it's large project dealers where they don't have an after sales service support and really it's a tendered situation they've won the job job they've fitted the kitchen and then uh, it's kind of left uh, to its own devices now it may be covered by an fm company but i think there are circumstances where we would we as the manufacturer would want to protect uh, that brand uh, as the guys have said uh, and you may see us you know we've also got a, a large service organization to support the hobart product and um, and so so i think there are times but i think generally particularly the independent customer we would expect the dealer to um, to follow up yeah, so just kind of leading on from that then, how often uh, should uh, dealers uh, say, as, as you mostly agree, that uh, it should be dealers rather than suppliers, but how often should they stay in touch with operators following a sale? I'll, I'll come to Ian first and then go to the dealers afterwards. Well, again, I think particularly when it's that independent, you know, the, the, the customer, you're looking you know, for that customer as a customer for life. And it's not just that initial maybe appliance or kitchen that you fitted out it's the ongoing uh, life of the kitchen and to build a, a long life customer so you know it's, it's really much up to them how they determine but I think you know we would certainly be saying you know uh, as the as a, a equipment comes out of warranty we would be then expecting um, the product to be you know the, the customer to be um, approached about ongoing maintenance and and you know not doing it on the cheap really and and just firefighting fix you know proactive preemptive maintenance where parts are, parts are even changed before they've worn out and therefore they kept going so you know I, again but I'd, I'd you know these I'd hand it back to the guys you know they're probably better at saying how they should be keeping in touch obviously my past life uh, you know I, I know that exactly how we would have approached it so so yeah let's come to you. Uh, Paul first um, how often would you say Brat Brothers then uh, keeps in touch with uh, end users after a sale? Uh, it should be often enough um, you shouldn't be you know there's two things on communications and contacts um, too little is a bad thing and too much can be a bad thing also um, they say that um, it's uh, there's uh, some statistic that it's nine times harder to go out and find a new customer than it is to um, uh, actually retain an existing customer. So, you know, um, we're, we're a heritage business. We celebrated 75 years um, as, a, as a catering equipment distributor this year. And we've relied heavily over that time on repeat custom and recommendation. So it's a, it's, 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 it is a vital thing that you get that contact correct. Correct. Um, I, I would suggest that obviously the project or a piece of equipment is handed over. Um, uh, it, all, all jobs are different from a one-off piece of equipment uh, replacement right the way through to a million pound plus project. They're going to be different, right? But I think Ian picked up on a really important point there, and that is that the 
the account management side of things, um, we, we'd be looking to our team to actually have that ongoing relationship with the client, check in with them, make sure that they're happy with it. We've alluded to training earlier. Often, especially in a scheme, you're showing a new team, new equipment, you're showing them a wear washer, a combination of an a fryer, um, refrigeration. You might give them an o &M manual digitally and physically, but um, there's a lot of information there to retain. So actually there's an opportunity to do an introduction at the very start on the equipment, but maybe after three months go in and do a little bit more of enhanced training, maybe in conjunction with the um, manufacturers, um, um, especially on sophisticated or complicated pieces of equipment, combination ovens spring to mind. Um, are they getting the most from it? Are they using it correctly? Are they using it most efficiently um, but there's also an opportunity then for companies uh, that offer service and maintenance as well as just selling the equipment and, and Ian's spot on with um, you know it, it is a really good idea to follow up six to nine months after the, the project has started because it gives you enough time to start the dialogue with them regarding a, um, a service and maintenance or preventative planned maintenance contract um, it shows you care um, we'd like to think that we do care um, and uh, we'd like to be um, uh, proactive rather than reactive in terms of heading off problems before they've even happened. So uh, that, that's our approach to it. Good stuff. Um, Nick, how about Advantage? How often do you like to keep in contact with, with your customers? I think it depends on the nature of the, the customer you're dealing with. Um, in my experience, professional chefs, people that really know what they're doing, um, they would find constant contact irritating uh, and in their way. But the guy who runs Pete's Cafe or has come from an insurance background and this is his first project, you know, he wants contact every day. So it's about managing who you've got and the time you have, notwithstanding the service agreements that you get in touch with. So it's always led by the customer for me. Rightio. And Dean at Miller's, how often do you like to keep in contact with, with your customers after a sale? To echo what everybody has said, the customer profile is really what drives it. Um, it's, it's very different for different customers, you know, as, as the guys have said, I think what's important and is probably lacking a little bit again in the industry from someone that isn't from the industry, I can maybe see this pretty clearly sometimes, the the lack of good CRM is quite challenging because, you know, in previous industries, we've had the same challenges, you know, what's, what's, what's the touch frequency, what's your contact strategy, what's your retention, blah, blah, blah. All of that's pretty important stuff. Um, never more so in this industry because of the wide breadth of profile of customer that you have, too much or too little, which is it? Um, you know, we're wrestling with that right now. Um, we know that certain customers need quite high touch. We know that some customers, you know, you sell them something and frankly, you know, you, you might not speak to or hear from them again for another 12, 18 months. Neither of those two things necessarily satisfy me because I think you've got to have a, a consistent approach to how you tackle all of that profile of customers. So it's not easy. It's not easy. And I think it's pretty much an ongoing battle that many of us will face for quite some time. Indeed, indeed. So... So at the point where you've got some customer feedback, I mean, how much would that influence the service that, that, that you would provide? Um, Ian, I'll come to you. How much does customer feedback influence what, what Hobart progresses with? Well, customer, it's customer, it's whether it be customer or dealer, you know, in that chain of supply, because, you know, we can have feedback and it's very important because, if there's product issues, we, we need to generally identify where they're coming from. And, you know, you know there's a catalog of standard format, you know, it's water conditions or it's installation. I know some of the guys won't like the fact that it might be installation led because that, that would be what the manufacturer would normally say. But, you know, it, it is, it's really understanding exactly where the issues are, if there are issues and, and not only uh, the negatives, but some of the positives. Uh, from that you know you'd like to know that people feel the equipment really is enhancing their operation and that what we can do or potentially identifying again training needs might be you know we need to put in uh, somebody there from our culinary team to go and help um, work with them on on the equipment 
So, you know, it's about, we want a satisfied customer at the end, the operator. And again, word of mouth and the fact that people are satisfied is, is generally what we can use as a point of reference to gain more sales. So the more information we get back, the better. If it's technical, we can feed it back to the factory and they can pick up, uh, whether it be a, a design led or a parts, you know, supply issue. So feedback is very important and uh, from all aspects um, of the supply chain, the route to market. Okay, so from the dealer side of things, uh, Nick, I'll start with you. Uh, advantage, how much does customer feedback influence the service that, that you guys provide? I agree most with what Ian said and, and we just add that good or bad response from customers, there's a response. So responses have to be dealt with quickly. Uh, we all have customers that we like dealing with, so they always tend to get a, a slightly better response. But um, yeah, good or bad, don't mind what the response is, we'll always deal with it. Rightio. Um, Dean at Miller's, how much does uh, operator feedback then influence how, how you provide your services going forwards? For us, operator feedback is pretty influential in terms of how we choose to navigate our business. And I think as a smaller provider, we are, you know, we have to do something immediately. Our speed of response is quick. And I think when you're a certain size, you've got that ability to be nimble. And I think you've got the ability to make decisions quickly and enact outcomes that are generally positive for the, for the customer. I think what's quite interesting when we um, kind of reflect on what Ian said, often when we talk about feedback that comes to us as a dealer, it isn't necessarily always about uh, product. You know, I, I don't feel that I can feedback too much to, for example, Hobart or Rationale about their product and expect them to do anything. You know, we're, we're a very small part of the overall picture. I get that. But I do think feedback from us as a customer to the manufacturers in terms of how quickly we get responded to, how quickly we get feedback, how quickly a delivery mistake is rectified is something that can be done significantly better than it is at the moment. You know, I, I don't expect Hobart to change the way their wear washers work. I do expect them to think about a different logistics company if they fail to keep delivering on time. Um, for me, I don't think the manufacturers are particularly keen to hear much feedback along those lines. Uh, they will hear it and then do their own thing anyway, because seldom do these things change in my experience, and yet they continue to persist and give us as a dealer and ultimately the customer something to, you know, to be challenged over. So, yeah, I think, that, again, it's a big topic, but I think there are sections in it that we do learn from. I think there are sections in it that people don't learn from. Right, so, I mean, Ian, did you want to kind of respond to yeah. those on behalf, those points on behalf of Hobart? <laughs> I think oh, I, I should really. I mean, I, I, I get Dean's point, and you know, like I say, I mean, I sat on their side of the table as well, so you know, I speak with experience on, on, from that side. But I think, with regard to you know, Hobart um, service, probably is handling somewhere in the region of about one hundred and twenty thousand calls a, a year. So you know, there is a volume issue there, in in as much as how how capable or able we are to respond to everybody. And I think, you know, it's, and we work in an industry that uh, uh, needs a response now because generally it's fallen over uh, when it's at their busiest time. Um, and therefore, they, there's high, highlight frustration. And, and Dean, as your customer, is going to be shouting at you. You're trying to get a response from us and, and not getting that. So I fully understand what you're saying. But I think, I think uh, some of the, certainly speaking on behalf of Hobart, um, you know, there's been over the last four years since I've been here, some significant changes within the structure within Hobart's service organisation. And our, our reaction times uh, and, uh, and uh, customer support has been uh, developed. Um, uh, you know, you talk about logistics. Uh, we, we sacked our, our logistics company and employed a new logistics uh, company because of issues that may, you may have experienced. So I think, uh, I think it's important. I think it's important to give us the feedback and it's important to know who you should give it to, I think, uh, so that it, it's actually listened to. Um, uh, and without it, I, you know, I think uh, you shouldn't feel that regardless of how big a business you are, 
that it's being ignored. I think it's we all need feedback to improve ourselves. Right, so yeah, um, Paul, I'm going to give you the last word on this. So again, um, from the points that have already been discussed, um, how influential is operator feedback on your own operations at Grat Brothers? And then how much do you then feed back uh, down the supply chain to kind of influence what they do too? Well, it's started quite positively. Let's finish positively. This is, um, this for me is, a, is, is, is very important. Uh, number one, uh, both from the uh, uh, operator to us and from us to the manufacturer. Um, again, it's a, it, it is a, it is a, 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 a direct line, um, and uh, uh, I think it's a win-win situation because we all want positive feedback, right? We we we, we love that, um, because it can be used for case studies or testimonials, uh, references in this world of social media posts. It's very quick to get good news out there. Um, but if you're if you are truly committed to um, uh, continual improvement um, uh, or or, or uh, have a desire to just get better and better, which you have to do these days, otherwise uh, you end up uh, losing your market share uh, to uh, to competitors that are getting it right, it's even more important to have that feedback when it's not gone 100% perfect. Um, because at least that affords you the opportunity to hear what's gone wrong and put it right for the next time. Um, we have, um, uh, I can't even guess at the amount of manufacturers and suppliers that we deal with um, um, because um, some of our clients have their own peculiar um, um, uh, uh, people that they insist that we use um, but there has been many suppliers and manufacturers that we've built up great working relationships with over many years so um, we have review meetings with our manufacturers and our suppliers especially our preferred um, suppliers the people that we work uh, most often with and I think that's the forum in which we can give them the feedback um, to what we're hearing from our customer or what we're experiencing ourselves as a as a distributor and again then the onus is on them and um, they either listen to what we're saying and take the um, uh, requisite actions to make sure that any issues are dealt with or they don't listen and if they don't listen we will be moving towards maybe a new preferred supplier within a certain product sector. So um, I think it, I think it's very very important that 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 feedback. And I think it's uh, I think the communication then up further back to the manufacturers is, is is it's a responsibility of ours because again just like it's we like to retain our customers we like to retain our suppliers as well. Um, um, it, 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 it's better the devil you know sometimes. <laughs> Right, yeah, I think on that note, uh, we, are, we are now out of time. So thank you very much all for joining us this week and join us again soon for another episode of Market Talk.